Well, our scripture reading today from Acts, uh, I'll bring you up to speed on the story. Peter goes before the city gates. He's on his way into worship, and he comes to the gate known as Beautiful, and there is a man there begging for alms who has been there uh, all of his life. From birth, he was lame. Uh, Peter has no money that morning, so he heals the man. And then he picks them up and takes him into worship. And everybody is stunned uh, there at the, uh, the portico chez. It's a portico where uh, it's known as Solomon's Porch. Uh, they ask a few questions and Peter gets right to the point. I don't know about you, but I like people who get straight to the point and tell you what's going on. Well, Peter hits them pretty straight up. Uh, this man's been healed by God. Uh, the God that healed him is Jesus. Uh, it's the same guy that you guys nailed to the cross. Right? You, you make a lot of friends this way. So uh, he, he, we'll, we'll read that text this morning. The other is from uh, 1 John. Uh, good, they didn't change it. It's from 1 John. It is a passage we often read at funerals. The first half about how we are being transformed and we will be transformed in the likeness of Christ. Uh, it's a very cheery verse at that point. Then it, we, we cut off the reading before we get to the rest of it because the next part's about sin. Uh, we don't talk about that at funerals at the Methodist Church, but it's here in Scripture. We'll get to it this morning. Well, let's pick up in Acts. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people. You Israelites, why do you wonder at this? And why do you stare at us? As though by our own power or our piety... We had made him walk, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. The God of our ancestors has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect help in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that the Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out. And from 1 John, the third chapter, beginning with the first verse. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has yet to be revealed. What we do know is this. When He is revealed, we will be like Him. For we will see Him as He is. And all who have this hope in Him purify themselves just as He is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that He was revealed to take away sins, and in Him there is no sin. No one who abides in Him sins. No one who sins has either seen Him or knows Him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as He is righteous. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, may the meditations of my mind and the words of my mouth be holy and pleasing unto you. Amen. When our children were little, Deb and I bought a minivan. Any of y'all ever had a minivan? An incredibly useful vehicle. It gets better mileage than an SUV. We could put seven people in it. 
Um, but they're like sackcloth for anybody who ever had a sports car. To, to crawl out of a sports car and to get into a minivan is like being sentenced, you know? So, uh, but we had a minivan. It was incredibly useful. I actually liked the car a lot. We had it a long time. Uh, we took it to seminary with us, and I, I, we left it in Kentucky because it was more expensive to drive it from Kentucky to Texas than it was worth. We bought that car new. It was, as we say, well-loved. Uh, I ended up selling it to another seminary student over the phone. I said, well, you might want to check it. Not everything works. It's not in great condition. And he goes, does it run? And I go, yeah. And he goes, it's better than my car. <laughs> Sold. <clears throat> he said, will you take payments? And I was thinking, Lord, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Come take it off my insurance. I'm already in the profit here. So yeah, please go pick it up. Just mail me a check. So anyway, uh, but the problem with our minivan was, if you've ever driven one of these, it had a large blind spot. It had more than one blind spot. Have you ever noticed that when you've had one? And the one thing about blind spots, uh, all cars have them, some are bigger than others, is it's really important to know them. And if you know about the blind spots, you can somewhat compensate for them, correct? I mean, if you know that there is a blind spot right here, you might want to look a couple of times before you change lanes. And if there's one over here, you, you want to be sure and get a good view. Uh, the blind spots that we know about are not really the issue. The ones that tend to bite us are the blind spots we don't know we have. Uh, you, you may not know this, but you know every one of us have blind spots in our eyes. Uh, unless you've studied some medical things, within your eyes, where your ocular nerve is in the back of your eye, there is a spot where your eye does not see. There's not any rods or cones there. And your eye, uh, your, your brain interpolates the information and fills in the stuff around it. If you want to go find your blind spots, you can, you can go to Google and blind spots, and there's a little test where you can do this with one eye covered. Uh, go home and try it. It's kind of fun. And you'll find that each eye has a blind spot in it. Uh, this is often how motorcycle riders get hit is because your mind is, he's, they're just about the right size to fit into one of your blind spots. Uh, now, if you keep your eyes moving, you tend to not have these blind spots as much. But, but that's what tends to get us is the, the things that are unexpected, the places we don't know that we're blind. Which brings me to today's text. How in the world could the whole world miss that the Son of God was in the midst? How did they miss Jesus? You ever wondered that question? And, and here Peter is, is, he was in your very midst, and what did you do with him? You traded the Son of life for a murderer. You traded life for death. Good call. It is true, though, that we sometimes don't pick the right things. And, I, and I'm going to let you know how I think we got it wrong then, and we continue to get it wrong today, is we are looking for, out of our Savior, incredible power and dictatorship. They were looking for somebody like David. What they weren't looking for was an itinerant preacher who preached love and forgiveness. You get the idea here? What they were looking for was one complete thing, and what came in the form of God was a man preaching a message of love and forgiveness, and all too often we're looking for domination and control. You don't have to agree, but you know where we are on this subject. We, we all want to be in charge and we all want to control things. And so we're often blind to maybe what God is up to. This past Friday night, we were, uh, Deb and I were watching a movie. Uh, I don't know if you do this or not. I try not to be seen too often in Walmart at the $5 movie bend. You know, you know the one. I've seen a couple of you there. Waiting for you to leave so I can go look. Right, there's the, the bin there with $5 movies, and she picked a movie. Uh, it's Book Thief. Yes, The Book Thief. Thank you, honey. Uh, it's a really good book. It's a really good movie. If you get a chance, watch it. It's hard to watch. It's about a young lady who was adopted by a German family at the beginning of World War II. And she is being raised in this family. There's an older gentleman there who's just as sweet and as nice and as kind as he can be. And the mother is, well, she put it this way, 
She's like thunder, always rumbling around in the background. Mom has some issues, as we like to say it, right? She's always uh, upset, a little bit controlling. And so these are the two people that are involved. Uh, during, it, during the movie, a, a gentleman shows up. His name is Max. Max is a Jewish young man. He's the son of a very close friend who saved this father's life. And so he owes him a life. And so he takes in this Jewish man and lets him live in the basement. It's a wonderful story. Well, during the middle of that particular story, all of a sudden, the daughter takes the newspaper and goes running downstairs. Now, she knows she has to hide him. She knows it's important. She knows that it may cost them all their lives that he's down there. But she takes a newspaper and she goes, I'm so excited. I want you to read this story. The story was that the Germans were winning the war on the Eastern Front and that Germany looked like they would win the war. For Max, this is not good news. Uh, You see, because if Germany wins the war, Max is going to lose his life. And he's just barely hanging on to life at this time. And then she begins to see what her narrow-mindedness about who should win the war, what it would cost her very dear friend. Uh, there's, there's one other scene where a, a Jewish man is, is being drug off and the, the kindly father, fatherly figure uh, grabs the man and tries to take him away from, uh, from the Nazis. And at that point, uh, he gets shoved down, he gets yelled at, he gets his name taken down. And the daughter asks a pointed question, what did you do wrong? He said, I reminded them of their humanity. You see, there was this idea of strength and power, and there's this whole other idea of reminding us of our humanity. Uh, That's the place that we often lose it. It is a difference between love and control and power. Well, as you all know, this past week, uh, I wasn't here preaching on Sunday. If you don't know that, that tells me where you were last Sunday, right? Right? Uh, Amanda filled in, I understand, did a wonderful job. She did so well, some people were going, we, we could have her preach more often. Let's not get too rushed. She did a fine job. Uh, but I was in prison, and Walter, Walter and I were in prison together, right? We were over at, uh, so you'll know which unit, we were at Polunsky and Livingston. It's the old Terrell unit, and it is where death row is. And if you are enough of a knucklehead, you too can be in this unit. Uh, This is where they send the worst of the worst. It's a supermax level six security prison. uh, And this is where they keep people of this kind of nature. Well, we go in and we're doing Kairos, which is a weekend of teaching basically people Christianity 101. Uh, The name Kairos means God's time. Kronos is a watch. Kairos is something, it's time for it to happen. So for these people, it's time for God to be doing something in your life. And so we teach them a short course on Christianity. Uh, we teach them about the church. We teach them that God is not out to get you. Uh, we, we go over a section on God, that God is not a, a, a warden. God is not somebody who's out to strike you down dead. In fact, God is pursuing you. And as we read in 1 John, God loves us. We are children of God. I think we misinterpret, and this is where we get blindsided, is we expect the angry God and what we have is a loving God. And for these inmates, love blindsides them. Uh, These are tough, big, ugly, angry. Uh, These men are not happy people. And they have a tough exterior, and they come in on the first day, and they've all got a mask on. Now, I will tell you, somewhere around day two or three, uh, we get to them. As one said, you Christians, you don't play fair. No. And where they're blindsided is by Christian love. What, what gets their attention is we come and we love on these people. Uh, one of the things we do, we tell them that in one of the talks, it's you're not alone. Uh, we have prayer sheets that people fill out. We cut them into strips. We form them into a chain. And then the chain is all glued together. Y'all made these as a child, right? Put them on your Christmas tree. Uh, we made those. And within the gym, it hung ceiling to floor as they brought it in all the way around the gym. They said, this many people are praying for you. 
that God will do something in your life this weekend. Well, you see at that point, you see a couple of them start kind of wiping some tears away and looking away because, you know, they don't want to be uh, crying at Kairos. You, you hear that testimony every once in a while. Well, I'll go to Kairos, but I'm not going to cry. And then they go, well, I'm not going to cry first. Uh, it's an interesting move because uh, out of the bitterness and brokenness, uh, if you're going to break through bitterness and brokenness, you better be ready for some tears to come pouring out. The brokenness that takes place, it comes out in tears as we're healed. Cedric was sitting at my table. Cedric was a large, he he is a large man. He's got a tank to fill, as he says. We bring them lots of food to eat. Uh, Cedric got up and when he gave his testimony, he says, I got some stuff in my life. I got some stuff in my life. And so I started going to meet some psychologists. They said, you got some stuff in your life. Anybody in here got stuff in your life? I tried being Muslim. They said, you got stuff in your life. I tried doing this. You got stuff in your life. He said, I came here and you people just loved on me. He said, you Christians are real. The state has to feed us. But you chose to. Uh, Cedric ate eight pieces of chicken while I sat next to him. I just kept handing him chicken. He's like, why are you giving me your chicken? I go, it's more fun to watch you eat chicken than it is for me to eat chicken. I, 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 get, free ch- I get chicken out in the free world all the time. And, and as I watched him eat, he began to realize that he was loved right where he was. It began to break down walls. You see, that's the blind side of a hard and tough world. And Cedric said, I came from a hard world. I live in a hard world. And he said, you Christians are even harder. Well, during the weekend, we also do several other talks. We walk people through forgiveness. Uh, Forgiveness is a large deal. Uh, Many of these men are guilty. I know that's stunner. Uh, They are in prison for a reason. And uh, after doing prison ministry for many years, thank God we have prisons. Okay, okay. there are people that need to be locked up because they are out of control. And uh, it's a good place for them. It's a good place for us. But having said that, I also read in this scripture that we are also guilty in our ignorance of what we have done to Christ. We are also guilty. So one of the things we work through is forgiveness during the weekend. And I've often given the talks on forgiveness. They had somebody else do it this week. And I'll tell you, there is a difference between preaching and and being in the pews. I I know that's a stunning idea to you guys. But if you're in the pews, you get to process more. If you're preaching, you get to remember what you're talking about with God's help. So uh, as I was sitting there and I was processing through forgiveness, one of the things we do, we have them pray and write down names of people that need to have and be forgiven. And I've been through this exercise multiple times. I've written many people's names down. Some of you may or may not be present today. Right? But we often need to forgive people. You know, the one thing I know about Crockett is we love our grudges in Crockett. Uh, We hold them, we polish them, we keep them, we remember them, we hold them dear, and we even tell other people about them. Yeah, y'all know what I'm talking about. Some of y'all even tell me. God bless your little hearts. And you know what? I have some unforgiveness in my heart too. I'm human. Uh, I'll I'll just go right there. I have some unforgiveness in my heart, and some of it I'm even unaware of. You know there's brokenness in our world we're unaware of? So as I was praying through this, one of the names that came to my mind was I wrote down my dad. I need to forgive my dad. And as I was sitting there, I remembered something that had happened during my Eagle Scout service When I was receiving my award, the evening that came, my dad read a particular section, and my dad was an alcoholic, and he was drunk at my Eagle Scout service, and he spoke like a drunk person. Uh, Some of my friends made fun of him, and they imitated him. They didn't know that he was drunk. I knew what was going on, and I realized in my heart I I I was harboring some unforgiveness about this. And then as I sat there, I began to think about my dad in his life at that time. And I thought, you know what? Dad was probably just trying to get through the week. 
Dad was probably just trying to get to Friday. Maybe Dad was just trying to get to Thursday. Maybe his dad was just trying to get to... Is anybody in here just trying to get through the week some weeks? Any of you ever just trying to get one foot in front of another to make it? And as I thought about that, I thought, how many places have I not been attentive to my children? Have I not been attentive to my wife? Have I not been in the room because I'm just trying to get to the next day? Not only did I forgive my dad, but there was forgiveness for myself. You see, there are people who live in prison that are out here in the world. And that prison is holding on to those places of unforgiveness, of that brokenness, of that thing that we think gives us power, but what it does is it takes from us. We're the ones held in bondage. Well, I can tell you lots of stories of men this particular weekend that came to Christ. One was a worshiping Native American, uh, wasn't Native American, he was just out in the yard with other Native Americans, he was at our table, he came forward, accepted Christ, we're, we're presenting posters, I thought he was going to talk about the poster, and he said, I've accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I was like, and I've been sitting next to you. Uh, it was a beautiful moment. His mother had written him letters asking him to do that because she was dying of stage four lung cancer. Uh, there was another man who was a Satan worshiper who came, shaved head with tattoos all over, eyeliner done all the way around his eyes. He walked in the room and I went, Satan worshiper. I mean, I, not to be judgmental, but I just went, whoa. He talked about his accepting of Christ. Uh, Cedric had been Muslim and dedicated his life to Christ. There, there are many stories of people who, when being confronted with love, were blindsided by this weekend. But one particular memorable story, and I'll just land on this story, was a particular man who was older. He said, you know, I always believed in God and I always believed in Christ. And he said, and I knew one day when I died that I would be in heaven with Jesus. That, that I knew. He said, but, but what was hard for me is I would see Christians who walked through the unit and they had joy. They were happy. They were living and had more. And he said, and you know what? I decided... I wanted that too. And that's why I came to this weekend at Kairos. Well, as, as we were sitting there, uh, we had a, a talk about building walls. Uh, I know none of y'all have built any walls in your life, so this won't apply to you. So. But uh, there are walls we all build in our lives, and we build them out of our favorite stone that's laying around in our life near us. Uh, stones of unforgiveness, stones of pride. And we polish them, we build a wall out of them, and we build it taller and taller till we shut out the world. And then the world becomes very stale. The air. And then finally, if Christ breaks through, He helps us take that wall all apart. Well, this talk goes on for a little while, and as, as, he, as we're going through this, this man had a physical reaction to the talk. Chair slid back. Uh, apparently, we were getting near, getting near the house for him. Later, uh, he said he felt God's joy come into his life. And he was singing, and he was dancing, and he was happy. And uh, I remember particularly, uh, you, you haven't had a real praise and worship service, so you've been singing, I Saw the Light, I Saw the Light, by the fabulous theologian, um, you're going to help me here, right? country and western singer hank williams thank you <laughs> hank williams uh as we as we played that in the unit i saw him dancing and singing with his hands in the air we don't do that often here but i saw him doing it and i was like well glory be to god here was a guy who was stuck and now is singing and dancing before the lord as I think about that, I, I think about what an odd sight it must have been for the man that Peter healed. Because he picked him up and he took him into the court and he took him to worship 
And there in worship before everybody, this man sang and danced before God by his healing. It's amazing the kind of healing that we all need. May God break into your blind spots. And may you see him. And may he heal you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.